Look, uh, welcome everybody to uh, the Canberra branch meeting for the month of August. Um, yes, l last minute uh, change of plan with the uh, the COVID outbreak. Um, I was looking forward to uh, meeting everybody at the uh, press club, but um, as Andrew said, uh, we'll have to wait a while until the uh, the lockdown disappears. So, what I'm going to present tonight is a, another. Um, one of my uh, data literacy series. So those of you that have seen me before are aware of the fact that I'm quite an enthusiast for data management and data literacy in general. And whenever I get an opportunity, I try and uh, help people make them a bit more literate. Um, sometimes it sounds as though it's just John telling people what to do, but I think it is important. There's a, there's a lot of misunderstanding about some basic terms and concepts in data management. And the title for tonight is designed hopefully to grab your attention, um, but there are a couple of themes in this that uh, I want to explore. And the, the magical metaphor is, is a very important one. Data integration platform, well, I could have said Harry Potter and the, the great lake debacle or Harry Potter and the uh, uh, analytics uh, <clears throat> Uh, platform engine that didn't work. It could have it could have been all manner of uh, things uh, in terms of platforms. It doesn't have to be specifically data integration. But yes, uh, as you'll see as we move on through the presentation, this this magical metaphor is is very important, and it's it's it, it's it's certainly worth considering. Now let's have a look. Let's see if we can move along. So I won't dwell on me. Um, I'm. Uh, CEO of Catapult BI. Um, I've been working in IT and data management for some decades now. And um, as I said, uh, data literacy is, is one of my passions and, and teaching. Um, so Catapult, you're a professional services business. We work with lots of different clients. We partner with lots of different uh, software vendors. I think that's enough advertising from that. So uh, what are we going to cover tonight? So um, Yes, pro many data projects don't succeed. They they often fail. They don't get delivered on time, or something gets delivered and it doesn't work. And it, it's it's quite disheartening to see this happen year in year out. Um, yes, uh, I'm 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 disappointed, and I'd like to try and contribute to having more projects succeed. And hopefully, some of the the ideas in this data literacy piece will uh, inspire people to perhaps run projects slightly differently. Um, the, the, the main thing I'm going to touch on tonight is the unfortunate but persistent belief in the magical power of software to fix things. Um, I've, you know, as I said, I've worked in um, software and data for, for several decades. And, you know, whether it's really smart people who, who know lots of stuff about IT or whether it's IT novices, there seems to be this um, persistent common belief that, you know, if you somehow go out and find the right software, um, the, you know, it will, you could install it in your business and, and it will somehow magically fix your data problems. It doesn't work like that. Uh, software on its own is not magical. Software on its own is pretty useless. Um, in order to make real progress in data management and have successful projects, you have to address all the different facets of capability. And to, to highlight uh, some of these problems and to, to, to show where the way forward looks like, I'm going to do a couple of examples. I'll look at uh, data quality as a practice and show you where software comes in as one facet of capability. And we'll also have a look at uh, tool acquisition. It specifically focuses on acquiring metadata management tools, um, but it is generalizable to, to other software tools as well. So that's what we're going to cover this evening. Um, there's the abstract. Uh, I won't read through that. I've sort of more or less spoken through it. Um, but what I would like to do now uh, is to show you a little video um, from Harry Potter. Um, I've, I've really enjoyed these movies over the years, going to the cinema with my children, and I love being immersed in the cinema. And just for a couple of hours or so, 
you know, letting myself believe in magic. Okay. Um, it's a very comforting, uh, pleasurable thing to do. And uh, just for a couple of hours, you can suspend disbelief and, and believe that magic is quite real. Now to do this, I'm just going to stop sharing this screen. I'm going to share another screen and fingers crossed that video will play. Now the sound quality on this recording, the video recording for Harry Potter is a little bit quiet. So you might need to turn your volume up to hear it a bit better. But uh, let's see if I can get this to work. Share the screen, media player. I still need a wand. A wand? Well, you want Ollivanders. There ain't no place better. Why don't you run along there and wait? I just got one more thing I got to do. Won't be long. be seeing you, Mr. Potter. It seems only yesterday that your mother and father were in here buying their first ones. Ah. Here we are. Give it a wave. Apparently not. Perhaps this. No, definitely not. No matter. I wonder. Curious. Very curious. S sorry, but what's curious? I remember every wand I've ever sold, Mr. Potter. It so happens that the phoenix, whose tail feather resides in your wand, gave another feather. Just one other. It is curious that you should be destined for this wand when its brother gave you that scar. And who owned that wand? We do not speak his name. The wand chooses the wizard, Mr. Potter. It's not always clear why, but I think it is clear that we can expect great things from you. After all, he who must not be named did great things. Terrible. Yes, but great. Why don't you run along there and wait? I just got one more thing I've got to do. It won't be long. So hopefully, uh, <clears throat> we're back uh, to the presentation and uh, just oh, still got that um, thing running. I'm back, yeah. Is, is it, has Harry Potter stopped? Yeah. Good, okay. 
<laughs> so uh, we're back to the presentation. So, um, so look, as I said, um, that story is. Uh, Oh, I've, I've still got Harry Potter running in the background. Hang on, I just need to turn him off. Sorry. Oh, come on. That's it. That's better. I'm back now. Um, yeah. So as I said, that Harry Potter, it's 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 great. I love going to the movies. Uh, I want to suspend disbelief. I want to believe in magic and. Uh, it would be amazing to have that wand that somehow magically finds its owner. And once you have it, you can then perform all sorts of amazing feats. Now, um, why do so many data projects fail? Look, um, it's not just myself, Gartner and other experts in the field have noted over the last few years that uh, many large ambitious projects uh, don't work. Uh, Gartner estimates that some like 80% of data lake projects don't make it into production. And look, most of the, the medium to large size organizations that I've worked with um, have got a, at least one failed data project. Now that data project might be a data lake. It could be analytics platform, data integration platform. They're all variants of the same thing. It's, it's a large, um, you know, ent ambitious, often enterprise-wide uh, undertaking. And some people have got more than one failed project. And look, why is it? Well, look, what part of the reason for this is that many of the, the, the fundamental data management practices, some of those hard yards around data governance, metadata management, uh, data quality, reference master data management, sort of they've kind of often got a bit overlooked in in the excited rush to go off and and build the new shiny software platform you know the whole of enterprise data integration platform some of those uh things have have got overlooked a little bit and often it's the case that there are a small number of project advocates within the organization and they just get carried away. Many of them, just like in Harry Potter, you want to believe in magic. And people end up convincing themselves that if you know, they go through the right acquisition process, somehow the right software will find its way into their organization. Once it's installed and set up, then all you have to do is press the button and somehow it's magically going to fix your data problems. And, you know, look, sometimes the vendors themselves get a little bit carried away as well. They like to explain all the latest powerful magical features, the, the, the machine learning, the graph database, the AI avatar, all of these amazing inventions. They, they, they make the software look so powerful and so wonderful. It will do just about anything. OK, and this is what that <laughs> that wand ends up looking with people want to believe that software works like a magic wand in there you've got the tail feather of a phoenix or you know it's quantum computing or something equally as amazing <laughs> and then there's all this super duper technology the latest whiz bang graph database knowledge representation it's got the the most amazing super technology around machine learning and its inference engine and it's got this ai powered avatar interface and when you put all these amazing technology bits together into one amazing piece of software it will fix just about anything it's 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 just so powerful and wonderful and that's what people end up believing. And, you know, partly like in Harry Potter, I want to believe, but then there's a bit of me that goes, no, <laughs> it's, it's fiction. It's a fairy story. And, and this is the problem with software, trying to separate and understand that boundary between, you know, yes, it is wonderful, it's powerful versus no, no, it's not magic. It can't fix everything. And, and this, and unfortunately, people end up getting sucked into and believing that once they've installed the software, configured it all, pressed all the right buttons, then somehow it is going to going to magically fix um, uh, the, the data management problems. Uh, and look, you know, at the end of the day, for those of us that worked in the industry a long time, software's not magical and it can't fix problems. However, you know, there is a way forward and that's around good data management. And if, if we 
know what good data management is and we practice good data management, then we can actually make organizations work better. And in general, working better means that our data management is going to make some of our, our business processes either more effective, uh, for instance, through uh, the discovery uh, and application of analytical insights, or it can make our business processes more productive. So something like a, a data asset register can help analysts find data and data work products more quickly, thereby saving time and effort and making them more productive. So, you know, with the right data management applied in the right ways, <clears throat> we can actually make our businesses run better. And software is an important part of that. But at the end of the day, software is just only one facet of data management capability. And all the different facets must be considered together. You can't just buy software on its own and expect the software to do everything for you. Let's move on. So what does good data management look like? Well, look, it's no surprise, it's a Dharma meeting. <laughs> so um, Dharma ha has, is a very, very good source of uh, inspiration in terms of what good data management looks like. So many of you will be familiar with the Dharma DM box. Um, it's, uh, uh, it codifies best practice uh, in data management, its, uh, its, its principles and its recommendations are applicable to all industry sectors and all, all, all parts of the world. It's, it's widely distributed, it's easy to read, lots of people are familiar with it, and, and one of the most familiar icons of, of Dharma is the wheel. And so, you know, we have here at a high level a summary of those different practice areas of data management, data architecture, quality, metadata, and so on, with data governance in the middle. So it is a good inspiration of what uh, uh, data management looks like. Now, within data management and those different practice areas, I believe that some of these are probably a little bit more important, a little bit more special, okay? And the reason for that is if you don't get these fundamental practices right, then everything else you try to do will be impeded, impaired, and just not progress as well as it should. And so I believe that things like data governance, metadata management, data quality, reference and master data, these are some of the most critical uh, practice areas that you really need to understand and improve in order to have uh, effective data management across the organization. So whatever you try to do in business intelligence is likely to reach uh, a, a, a roadblock. It's likely to be impaired if, if your metadata, your governance and data quality isn't up to scratch. Let's just move on. So those are the, the different areas. Um, in terms of organizational capability and, and doing an uplift in these different practice areas, capability covers a number of different things. We need to have policy. We need to have direction in terms of what good looks like. And that needs to be well written. People, they're another facet of capability. They need to have the right skills. They need to understand their roles. Uh, there's often uh, considerable amounts of organizational knowledge, so um, not the general principles in, in the MBOC, um, not the specific skills, but, you know, how, how does our business work? What's our business ecosystem? Who do we cooperate with? Who do we compete with? Um, there's there's, there's a, a large amount of organizational knowledge that needs to be in people's heads in order for the, uh, the business to work and in order to do good uh, data management practice. Processes, we need to have defined processes that can be executed and measured. There can be processes for doing data quality, processes for doing data modeling, data architecture. These things need to be defined so that people can, can follow the right processes. And part of it is automation. So people don't have to do all the work. Some of the work can be done by software. So out of all of the activity that we've identified, and, and defined as being good data management practice, software can contribute to some of it. 
Bear in mind, it is only one facet. If we just go out and buy the software on its own, then it's not going to magically fix things. We need to have all the different facets of capability. So to illustrate this uh, notion of different facets of capability and where software fits in, we'll have a look at uh, the practice of data quality. And let's have a look at this. So um, in order to do data quality, the thing we have to start with is we need to have definitions of what good data looks like. If you want to say something is good quality or bad quality, what do you compare it to? OK, if I've got a piece of data and I want to determine whether it's good or bad, I need to be able to compare it to something that is defined as goodness. And uh, data definitions are examples of um, what good data looks like. So uh, in, in this example here, we can have definitions of tax file numbers, Medicare numbers, customer numbers, product numbers. There's lots of different things that we can define. And when we do data quality, we will refer to those definitions. Um, we've got an example here. We can have colors of the rainbow. Um, it could be quite important to uh, some application. Uh, and so we can define the colors and we can define the sequencing of those colors. So data definitions, we need to have a definition of what good likes if we're going to do some quality comparisons. And then here's where the different facets fit together. So in order to do the practice of data quality, we need to have a best practice framework. So we've got our DMBOC over here that's going to inform and guide us. We need to have policies, legislation, standards that define what kind of data we manipulate and how that data should be used. And then human judgment ultimately comes up with these definitions. Humans have to say, this is the correct definition of a Medicare number. This is a correct definition of color of the rainbow or whatever it is uh, that we're, we're defining. Once we have those definitions, we can upload them into a metadata registry. That metadata registry stores those definitions. And then finally, we can actually get to the actual piece of software. So the data quality software tool, it's going to do some profiling. It can actually read those definitions from the registry. It can then ingest our source data and it can compare the data that comes in with the actual correct definitions. So are those fields with, with bits of data in them, are they really Medicare numbers? Are they really colors of the rainbow? What are they? And so <clears throat> we can then have the software produce a data quality report. And it tells us after profiling that, that source file, uh, how good it is, you know, how, how well do those definitions uh how, how well does the data compare to the, the correct definitions so we've got all the different bits here we've got human judgment we've got policies this this whole thing this sequence is a process that's been defined and we execute and we've got a bit of software over here bear in mind that software on its own can't do data quality without the process and the people and the policies so that's different facets of capability the next example I want to look at is uh, around software tools. Um, how do we go about acquiring them? So software is an important uh, facet of capability. So how do we go about identifying what is the right software? It's not like uh, Harry Potter's wand. The wand doesn't find the wizard. Um, so software doesn't somehow magically arrive in your organization and find you. You have to go through a, a, a process. And so here's an example of what a process looks like for actually um, finding and acquiring um, some good software. So we're going to look at the example of metadata. Why metadata? Well, because in my opinion, it's metadata management and, and metadata is one of the most important practices of data management. Metadata is the adhesive that binds everything that you do in data management together. So every time you do some data quality, data governance, data security, any of the practice areas in the wheel, that practice area either produces or creates or updates metadata. Metadata binds everything together. So metadata software tools are an important part of building up good metadata management capability. So how do we go about 
um, finding the right metadata tools and, and acquiring them. So just a little bit of a reminder about what metadata is and where it comes from. So where do we find it in the digital workplace? Pretty much everywhere we've got some data, we'll find metadata as well. And uh, it, it's, it's basically uh, it just, just about everywhere. Now, there are a whole class of very, very powerful metadata management tools. We call them data cataloging tools. These data cataloging tools allow us to manipulate and manage uh, this metadata that exists in the organization. And some of them are very, very powerful. They can harvest metadata automatically. They have these scanners and smart connectors that can link to all the different uh, sources of uh, in information in the organization and suck out the metadata from them. Now, these uh, tools, when they do this harvesting, can produce extraordinarily large quantities of metadata. There can be hundreds of thousands or even millions of data objects uh, that are located through this uh, metadata harvesting process. So these are quite powerful tools, and we do actually want to have some of these in our organization. But what's the right way of going about acquiring them? So key thing to note here, and this goes back to that diagram I showed you earlier around the metadata pervading all the different practice areas, there are lots and lots of different kinds of metadata. This is not an exhaustive list. There are other kinds of metadata as well. But this is important. Metadata isn't a single uniform thing. There are lots and lots of different kinds. There's raw technical metadata, there's reference data, there's uh, uh, data quality, there's definitions, there's, there's many, many, many different kinds of metadata. And that's an important thing to note. And another important thing to note here is, in my opinion, there is no one tool to rule them all. So there are lots of very, very good metadata management tools out there, but each of these tools has strengths and weaknesses. Some are better at some things than others. This is a, an example of some names. It's not an exhaustive list of all the names of the tools, but there are many, many tools out there. Some are good at managing some kinds of metadata. Some are good at managing other kinds. There isn't one tool that is uh, heads and shoulders above everything else and is wonderful at managing everything. So, if we're going to get metadata management tools, what sort of things do we want those tools to help us to do? So the main thing we want those tools to help us to do is to construct and make available what I call business facing data services. So people in different areas of the business, they might need to uh, find uh, glossary terms. They may be able to want to locate standard data definitions. They might want to browse the information landscape. There are lots of activities that people want to do, uh, which I call data services that are going to help them do their, their job. And the metadata is a key enabler for many of those services. So some examples here, so if we're gonna browse the information landscape, if that's a service that we're gonna to provide to business users, what particular kinds of metadata do we need to enable and to build that business facing data service? So we might need raw technical meta, enriched technical metadata. If we're gonna provide a different service, um, which uh, provides people with glossaries of terms, what kind of metadata do we need to support that? So part of good data management is identifying within the business what sort of services, data services, do different people in the business need. Those data services are made out of lots of different bits of capability, including tools. Um, but of course, some tools will be better some metadata than others. So we need to do that initial mapping and understand that for any particular data service that people consume, what types of metadata do they need to enable that service? As I mentioned earlier, there is no one tool to rule them all. So some tools will be um, better at managing some metadata than others. Each has their own strengths and weaknesses. So we need to understand not only what 
kinds of metadata are needed to support the data services, but we also need to understand in terms of each individual tool and their functionality, how does their functionality map onto the different kinds of metadata. So we're now in a much better position to uh, sensibly acquire the right software tools, metadata management tools to support our business. And where does it start? Well, it starts with knowing your business, understand the business processes that consume and produce data. What kind of data services does that business need? And here's the, the steps that we go through. So as I said, understand the business processes, understand the pain points, and importantly, where are the opportunities to improve business decision-making by supplying the right kinds of data service to those people at the right times. So we understand, we analyze, and then we identify specific data services that are gonna address the pain points that are gonna make people more effective or gonna make people more productive by providing those data services to them. Those data services are enabled or driven by different kinds of metadata. And of course, we've mapped those data services onto the different kinds of metadata. What we've done here in step four is we've now, now that we know what kinds of metadata we need, what kinds of tools and which vendor products really provide the best support for those specific kinds of metadata. So what we can do then is we can then identify a collection of candidate tools, okay? So in this particular example here, we've got uh, vendor B, vendor C, the functionality of those products overlaps with the metadata that we need to enable those data services. Once we know that, then we can go through an acquisition process, uh, it might be a competitive procurement activity, and we can go out and we acquire one or more of these tools to support that kind of functionality. We then can develop a, a, a plan to deploy them. We can go through the process of deployment and hopefully by deploying those data services enabled by these metadata tools, we will hopefully make the business work better by providing um, data services that address known pain points, improve efficiency and productivity. So that's what a good process looks like. It's, it's, it's not simple. <laughs> it does in, involve quite a bit of effort, okay? As I said, there's no one tool to, to rule them all. Now, there's some wrong ways of doing this. And this is, these wrong ways are, are examples that we've seen before when we've been out consulting with various clients and trying to understand why some projects just didn't work. And a very common one is what I call the reverse journey. So the reverse journey, uh, somebody in the organization has a bucket of money. They think buying tools is a good idea, possibly because of some belief in the magical power of software to fix things. They buy a bunch of tools. They then try and work out what the tools are good for. Something to do with data management, I think. Uh, who in the organization is responsible for data management? I know, let's hand it over to them and they can go and find some business stakeholders who can develop a plan to use them, okay? So completely the wrong way around. Again, you know, that belief in the magical power of software to fix things often tricks people into this trap of thinking, well, you know, just like the, the, the one chooses the wizard, somehow that software is going to find us, it will find us, and then we can buy it. Once we've bought it, all we have to do then is just install it, and it somehow magically fixes stuff. Another wrong way of acquiring tools is what I call the, the vendor CIO group driven. So a bunch of vendors uh, approach the CIO group. The CIO group run lots of uh, bake-offs and demos and POCs and stuff like that. And, and through that, they conduct what they call a technology evaluation. And the, the CIO group go, yep, these, these look like pretty useful things. 
They're very, very powerful. They seem to have lots of amazing functionality. Yeah, we'll go and buy them. And so they go and buy them. They then hand them over to somebody in the organization they think is responsible for data management. And then they go, well, hang on, what are we supposed to do with these? Um, so that's uh, another example of the wrong way and unfortunately quite common. Uh, another wrong way is let's take the shortcut. Um, and this, this often happens uh, uh, shortly after big Gartner conferences where CIOs and CEOs and CFOs go to the Gartner conference and they get all giddy and excited by the presentations and they pretty much convince themselves they know how the business works and they know how to make the business work better. We just need to buy that amazing AI driven avatar powered super duper software that we, uh, we learned about at the Gartner conference. Let's go out and buy it. And so they go out and buy it and then they hand it over to the business says, look, can somebody who knows something a bit about data management sort of install this magic stuff and make it work better. Um, again, the wrong way to do it. So there's, there's right ways, there's wrong ways. As I said, part of this comes from misunderstanding that software is only one facet of capability. You need to have those other facets in order for uh, value to be derived from software. And also just this, this belief that people get sucked into that somehow software has amazing powers and software on its own can somehow magically fix stuff because it's so powerful and amazing. So that specific approach to acquiring tools, uh, the right ways and the wrong ways, that was focused on metadata. Um, why? Well, because I think metadata management is, is one of the most fundamentally important practices in, in any organization. Even though the focus was on that, the overall approach should be the same for any other data management tool. It starts with understanding business needs, who's making what decisions, why they're making those decisions, what kind of information data services do they need in order to make better decisions. Identify business facing data services that address those needs and those services are not just software. Those services are often skilled consulting that goes with it. They're uh, bodies of knowledge that need to be built up. They're process definitions, there's guidelines. Those data services are not just software. And even the software that's involved in them, it can actually be not just one vendors, but actually a combination of different vendors software together with all the process and the people and the skills that then becomes the service, the business facing data service that people can consume. Understand how different vendors software map into those data services, identify candidate tools, be very clear about for each vendor tool, what is the coverage of their functionality, and importantly, their integration capability with other tools, because there is typically no one tool to rule them all. And often, business facing data services need to be built out of two, three or more vendors products. Don't rely on a single point of organizational expertise or authority in, in that software tool selection. It's, it's very easy for one person, um, particularly at a very senior level to get, um, to get trapped into some unhelpful thinking. And that unhelpful thinking might be a belief that somehow software is all we really need. And if we bite the rice, buy the right software, it will magically fix stuff, okay? Don't take shortcuts. You need to go through that process very, very carefully of understanding need, defining data services, mapping that into uh, software functionality, evaluating vendors against the functionality, remembering that software is only one facet. Do you have the process? Do you have the people with the skills? Have you got the right policies? All of those different facets of capability are part of that data service that you're going to offer. And hopefully, <laughs> if you take those, uh, those warnings, if you heed that advice, then there's a reasonable chance that you will actually have a successful data management project. And that 
whether it's a data integration platform, uh, an analytics platform, a data lake, whatever it is that you're trying to build, um, then uh, if as long as you follow the right steps, you don't get carried away, you understand the limitations of software, you remember it's only one bit of facet of capability, it's not magic. <laughs> if you remember all of that and do it all in the right order, then there's a reasonable chance that the project might actually work and deliver something useful. So that's the, uh, the main part of my presentation tonight. Um, hopefully it's being entertaining and um, a little bit uh, educational. Um, some of that stuff might be a little bit controversial. I'm happy now to take questions. And uh, Andrew, can I go back to you now? Um, if I stop sharing, can you yep. then take the questions? Yep. So we have one um, question coming. Yeah. On the chat. Uh, do you follow the same states and selection of tools for more complex businesses, i.e. scale, e.g. multinational, whole government, etc., or is it a meta-meta model for doing this? Also, can you, we use proof of concepts for a tool selection using representative parts of the business rather than the full business and use these as a pattern for tool choice? Yeah, look, um, it's, it's quite a complex, big question, that one. Um, yeah, look, I think uh, un understanding what are the business problems and understanding this notion of data service, how, how will a data service make the business work better is the critical thing. Whether that's in a small or a large organization, whether you're dealing with just a portion. So a very large organization with many groups and divisions, um, you know, the, the, they, they may require slightly different data services in different parts of the organization, whereas some data services might be universal. Um, so something like uh, a service to provide a, a business glossary or a, a data asset register type of service to people, various data discovery services that people consume, many of those will be pretty much the same service right across the organization whereas some parts of the organization might have something that's very specific to them. It might be the legal department needs uh, a data service around uh, legal documents and legal advice that other parts of the organization don't know. So there will be some data services that are pretty much universal and some might be quite specialized to particular branches, sections, and so on. So, uh, in, in terms of the, the process, it's still the same. So uh, that uh, service that you're providing, uh, what kinds of uh, metadata is required uh, in terms of other data management um, practice areas, you know, what sort of governance do you need? What sort of, uh, if it's a BI type of service, what type of visualization and analysis do you need? You, you pretty much go through the same process. Um, as I said, some data services are going to be fairly universal and others are going to be a bit more specialized. Um, some, some complex data services may be built out of simpler ones. So it could be that you have quite a complex uh, project initiation, project assurance, project management service that you provide that is actually made out of simpler services. So data services can be made out of complex data services can be made out of other simpler data services. So um, hopefully that kind of answers it. In terms of the other bit around proof, yeah, well, look, proof of concepts is, is one way of understanding um, the, the, the coverage of functionality of, of vendor products, um, definitely. It's, it's not the only way, but it's, it's one way of doing it. Um, obviously, it can get quite tricky because you've done all the right analysis, you've identified your data services, you've identified uh, functionality, and it turns out that there's potentially, you know, four or five or six different vendor products that might actually help implement that service. So it could be that your list of candidates then becomes quite big, in which case, you know, the, um, the selection criteria for the tool is, is going to be beyond functionality. It could be licensing costs. It could be support 
available in country. So there's a whole bunch of other factors apart from just mapping to functionality, which you need to consider when uh, uh, doing that procurement activity. But at the end of the day, you still need to start with what are the business problems? Uh, who, who needs to consume what kinds of data services? If we're going to build those data services, what are the different facets of data management capability that we need? Some of that facets of capability is software. <laughs> what, what software functionality specifically do we need? Um, that, that's pretty much the same. Okay, That, that doesn't change. Um, as I said, with large organizations, you might have some very niche specialized data services and complex data services can be built out of simpler ones. It was a big, big question, that one. So the, the answer was, was big as well. Well, this should be a, a simpler one. Does John know of some companies that have started the process of sensibly, sensibly and achieved some benefit? And so the process of purchasing tools. Yeah. Sorry, I'm not sure. What was the question again? Could... Uh, do you know some companies that have started the process of sensibly? Some, some organisations, some consumer, yeah. 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 Uh, Yes, look, uh, uh, there are aspects of sensibleness in, in a lot of different uh, software acquisition around data management, but there's sometimes the sensibleness is blended in with silliness. So um, it, it's, it's not a simple case that uh, organization X, um, everything they did was silly, all right? It could be that there was... Uh, a reasonable degree of sensibleness, but somewhere in that uh, process, someone got it wrong. You know, they, they got carried away. Oh, yes, so this AI component's going to magically sort that out. That's all good. Well, hang on a minute. <laughs> no, the AI component's not magically going to sort anything out. And so, you know, you, you can end up with um, a fair degree of sensibleness, but at some critical points in that uh, acquisition process that, tool identification and acquisition, something went wrong, okay? Um, and, and sometimes it's not just the software. Bear in mind, software is just one facet of capability. You need to have people skilled and trained in, in the um, data management practice. Perhaps you just can't find people with the right skills. So even if you end up buying something that looks like the right software, well, yeah, but there's, there's no one to run it. <laughs> Uh, we, we haven't got anyone with the skills. We don't, we don't know what to do with it. So it could be that you end up buying the right software, but you just don't have the, enough of the other facets of capability. Um, and yes, yeah, it's, it's not a simple, it's not that, you know, lots of people just do it all wrong and a small number of people do it all right. You know, there's, there's bits of good and bad in, in pretty much all of these uh, tool acquisition processes. So that's what I did. An organization has already chosen the tool and asked the information data architect to retrospectively deliver the business and data architect to fit the tool. What can be done to reduce the harm <laughs> before choosing the spell? Well, to yeah, well, look, I, I guess um, at the end of the day, you've got to be able to quickly, somebody has to be able to quickly recognize those patterns of. Uh, poor uh, tool acquisition practice, you know, the shortcut or the reverse journey, um, you know, you, you, it, it needs to be someone senior in the organization needs to understand that there are right and wrong ways. And, uh, you know, th those, those wrong ways need to be detected early. And that could be through some new, a uh, governance structure, uh, uh, a tool acquisition committee that oversees and makes sure that no uh, single or small group of enterprise architects gets carried away and goes off and buys stuff that simply can't be utilized. All right. Um, yeah. At the end of the day, it, there has to be the appropriate governance um, and it would look subtly different depending on which organization it is. But you know, and also it goes back to generally in the organization, how is data management capability cultivated, sustained and fostered? Um, you know, my belief is it should be 
in some sort of CDO or data division that lives on the business side of the house, not buried somewhere in, in the IT shop. So, you know, there's, there's certain governance practices that I think are better than others uh, and are more likely to lead to uh, better uh, tool acquisition. Um, you mentioned that some software is better than for some things and not others. Yeah. Yeah. Has this been documented anywhere? An unbiased comparison of the strengths and weaknesses that we yeah. look, um, you know, the Gartner, uh, the magic quadrants are, are an interesting starting point. Uh, they're not the be all and end all, um, but they're, they're, they're one source. Um, Gartner are not the only people. Forrester and other organizations frequently do things like magic quadrants. Um, forget Forrester, call them something different, magic something or others. Unfortunately, the word magic doesn't help. <laughs> um, you should call them something else, uh, not magic. But um, yeah, th those are good places to start. Um, and then, you know, um, just, just doing independent research. Uh, some, there are some academic studies. Uh, there are some universities and research institutes that occasionally do this kind of analysis as well. Um, you, you, you can go and talk to consultants who know stuff, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, that there are, there are good consultants out there who, who basically aren't, aren't in the business to sell software. They're, they're, they're in the business to provide independent advice. So there are, there are consultants who can help you with that and you can do your own research. So yeah, that the, there is there is ways of getting that information. Okay. Um, uh, and, and there are different sources, but ultimately you're going to have to make a judgment in terms of the credibility or quality of any uh, information that you get. Uh, as I said, the Gar Gartner Forrester, it's, it's, it's okay. It's a starting point, but I wouldn't take everything they read as gos uh, write as gospel. Um Particularly, uh, yeah, that some of the weightings, um, uh, the, the way that they weight, uh, ability to execute. Yeah, they're, they're, I've got some concerns about that. But, you know, as I said, you don't rely on one single source. Do as much research, you know, talk to vendors. You need to talk to vendors, talk to consultants who don't sell software, um, do, do research, find, find uh, reputable research institutes that, that you can get advice from. Uh, the, the last question we got is uh, you spoke a lot about metadata management tools. Mm. How do you distinguish these from data integration tools? Would anything in the overall process change? Uh, no, the process is largely the same. Um, da data integration is is focused on yeah, well, bringing bringing data together, transforming data so it can be joined and merged in, in meaningful and sensible ways. Um, a, a lot of data integration activity as a practice area uh, relies on uh, metadata, uh, good metadata management. Um, so as, you know, my belief is that you know, metadata pervades all the practice areas. And in order to do any of those practice areas well, you need to understand the particular kinds of metadata that you're data integration practice depends on, um, or if it's a data modeling practice, uh, the models that you create are another form of metadata. Um, how, how are those metadata models uh, used and integrated with all the other different kinds of metadata in the organization? So yeah, da data integration, um, the, the, the overall process of understanding uh, what data integration capability you need in the organization um, and how that capability is used in the construction and delivery of business facing data services is, is a key part to it. So the last question is at the Gartner conference this year, it was stated that for large enterprises with low data maturity who are slow to start the data management journey Data cataloging might be a pointless activity. It's the to devious or dispel this advice. 
Yeah, so, and, and I think we need to distinguish between data cataloging as a, as a class of software tools from metadata management, okay? Everyone needs to do metadata management, and at some point in time, they're probably going to need some tools of some kind, but uh, they may not actually need the metadata harvesting, the automated harvesting of metadata that some of the, uh, well, most of the, the powerful tools that you'd see from uh, Informatica, IBM, ASG, Irwin, et cetera, Alation, those, those very, very powerful uh, tools that can go off and automatically harvest raw metadata from data sources, that's sort of, if you like, the core business of most data cataloging tools. Many organizations are simply just not mature enough to, to, to use those tools because uh, when you install them and plug them in, they can generate vast quantities of raw metadata that is, for a low maturity organization, unmanageable. What do we do with millions of all these bits of metadata that it's found? I don't know what to do. What, where do we store them? What, what do they mean? How do, how do we make it help our business? So it, it, it does require a certain degree of maturity and proficiency in, in different areas of, of data management and in metadata management and data governance before you can get significant value from uh, a powerful cataloging tool that is automatically going to harvest vast amounts of um, raw metadata. Um, a, a metadata registry of prescriptive metadata, so things like a, a business glossary, uh, data domain definitions, that kind of prescriptive metadata is generally very, very small compared to descriptive metadata that's harvested by data catalogs. And so starting off with a metadata registry and a small tool to, to help manage a metadata registry of prescriptive metadata is often a better first step for most organizations than jumping into a full-blown uh, data cataloging tool that could potentially harvest more raw metadata than you know what to do with and it would just confuse you. But at a certain stage of, of maturity, uh, a data cataloging tool, uh, specifically uh, a, a, a harvesting tool that, uh, that automatically finds and harvests raw metadata is required um, in order to, to produce uh, complex, sophisticated, business-facing data services. So you, you, you do need one eventually, but you just might not be ready this year for one, but there's always something else we can progress instead. Okay, well, thank you, John. That was um, very insightful. As usual, mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, yeah, so we hope to have uh, you back again next year. Um, I'm, I'd be delighted, Andrew. <laughs> and uh, we'll unfor a, unfortunately, unfortunately, we're going to have to have a uh, co-present with, and we'll give them this, the, uh, a beautiful case study on how how it works. Yeah, and uh, we'll have to go and have drinks and nibbles on our own. <laughs> <laughs> COVID uh, goes away. I know, we've got to think positive anyway. I know. Um, okay. But uh, anyway, look, uh, thanks everybody who, who's, who's dialed in tonight and, and listened. Hopefully uh, you've found it entertaining, um, a little bit educational, um, might be a bit controversial and be delighted to continue the conversation with, with anyone in the community. Um, you can contact me directly or through, through the Dharma branch and um, happy to, to continue the conversation. And uh, I'll send you the PDF, Andrew, so you can upload it on the, on the website. Yeah, so we'll, we'll send out the link to the recording and the PDF. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Well, thanks, everybody. Um, good night. And, okay. Uh, <laughs> see you again in a month or so, hopefully in person. Yes. Well, who knows? <laughs> Fingers crossed. All right. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye. All right. Cheers. Bye.